event. This is um, uh, the first of our international Zoom calls for uh, the fall and winter and spring. Um, and um, we've taken up, as I think probably everybody has a sense already, um, uh, this topic of what matters now. There were a lot of incentives to think at that scale. Um, one of them is the 10th anniversary of the project. It seemed like a good moment for us to pause and say for ourselves collectively and for our work, what actually matters now? Um, and I wanna thank Diana who's here, um, who was um, my dear partner from way back in making this happen and Susie Moser joined us. And so we, uh, we did start, we got our original funding for doing this work in um, 2012 from the Mellon Foundation. And then we brought together a group um, where in which a couple, several people here, including Willa, who's one of our guests today, and Diana and Kathy, Kathleen Dean Moore, um, were part of that original circle along with Susie. Um, I don't think anyone else is here from that circle, but Bonnie Menel was our consultant in figuring out how in the world do you use this venerable practice that she studied for decades um, as a, a base, a foundation for doing the work of deep listening and showing up for our times. So thank you all for helping um, get us to 10 years of celebrating this work. And so when I was thinking about <clears throat> how to characterize um, what matters now, I was, I've done um, little bits of writing and we are coming out with a a booklet um, very soon um, that will capture some of your voices as to um, why the council work is important. But I thought I would just read this very short invocation of um, what the topics are for this work over the course of the year. Um, so what matters now? Slowing, releasing into the present moment, feeling our oneness, with the earth, listening with attention, responding with care, leaning into the flow of life, mycelial and emergent, trusting ourselves as community and possibility, a living entity, feeling the wonder of our existence and continuing, persisting. So that's what we're going to be thinking about over the course of the year. Um, and so today we are really lucky to have Willa Blythe Baker, who's in our original group. And somebody has, uh, needs to mute. I'm not sure where that is. Maybe somebody who just came on. Okay, I think it's fine. Um, Willa and Emily Rabito is with us. Um, and Michael Lipson. Um, and Kevin is going to convene today. Kevin Gallagher, our dear colleague. Where is he? There he is. Um, and so he will introduce these three people who've been part of our community, actually. Some of them, like Willa, for literally 10 years, and um, Michael and um, Emily more recently. So thank you all so much. Turn it over to you, Kevin. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for that intro introduction to what I'm sure will be a wonderful program throughout this year. Um, as we arrive, and hopefully we have our full group with us at this point, why don't we just take a moment and uh, practice what we're about to explore and, and fully arrive in this place. And so uh, let go of whatever was occupying your attention before you arrived here together. So maybe settle into your chair. Feel the ground beneath your feet. The feeling of the chair beneath you. Do whatever it is that helps you become fully present in this place 
in this moment. Now perhaps take the three deepest breaths that you've taken yet today. And with that, I'll move into introducing our guests. And so as Sarah mentioned, we have three members of our council community here with us. We have Lama Willa Baker, who as Sarah mentioned is a member of the National Council, longtime member of the community and of the Green Dharma program. Lama Willa is the founding teacher and spiritual co-director of the Natural Dharma Fellowship in Boston, Massachusetts, and its retreat center, uh, Wonderwell Mountain Refuge in Springfield, New Hampshire. Lama Willa writes, teaches, guides meditation retreats, and develops a curriculum for people interested in cultivating a deep meditation practice in daily life. Her teaching interests include the wisdom of the body, eco-dharma, non-dual awareness, and compassion. Michael Lipson, our second guest, was a member of the Eco Sattva Council. Michael is a clinical psychologist in private practice in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. As a George Soros faculty scholar on the Columbia University faculty, he developed a training program in meditation for health professionals who treat the terminally ill. Michael has written two books on meditation, with a third coming out in 2023, titled B, An Alphabet of Astonishment. His weekly writings, as well as online and in-person meditation groups, have to do with the miraculous nature and outward-facing efficacy of shared inner work. And Emily Rabito, she was a member of our Writers and Journalists Council. Emily writes at the intersection of social and environmental justice, race, climate change, and parenthood. She's the author of Searching for Zion, The Quest for Home in the African Diaspora, and is a contributing editor at Orion Magazine and a regular contribut contributor to the New York Review of Books. She was the recipient of an inaugural Climate Narratives Prize from Arizona State University, among many other distinctions. She has recently served as nonfiction faculty at the Bread Loaf Environmental Writing Conference and is a professor of cre creative writing in the English department at the City College of New York in Harlem. So if we could all pr provide a warm welcome to each of our guests. Um, and with that, we'll start with our first question. And so I'll ask each of you, what does slow down and listen mean to you? And why does it matter now? And Willa, if we could start with you. Well, I'd like to begin just by sharing what is beyond my screen, um, the that I'm listening to right now, even as I was just listening to you, Kevin. So I just want to share this, just the, the panorama. For a moment. And I wanted to share that because For me, <clears throat> these words, slow down and listen, um, are the words that are spoken in a non-conceptual language by the wild and more particularly by the, the plant world and the tree world, <laughs> which live in a different kind of time than we do. Um, and for myself, you know, I think even the words, even how we, how we are, how Sarah chose to start the series on what matters most with slow down and listen, just is an indicator of what we need at this moment when we are sped up 
and and more in the mode as a culture of production and of speaking and of problem solving you know finding a space to to slow down and listen is finding sanity a place of sanity from which to in which to hold the truths that we know um so for myself somehow you know also being uh, prone to the speedy energy the transmission the counterbalance for me for that is is the time of the tree or the time um, yeah, especially of the tree that is a slow steady long range pace of being and that time of the tree reminds me of um, what we what we find in some Buddhist texts uh, out of the non-dual awareness traditions. Um, there's a teaching on time that I find very useful for thinking about what we need in these times. And these times, especially when we're confronted with the truth of climate change and the truth of um the earth's deep cry of suffering our minds go straight to the future you know what can we do for a better future and i think that is important uh, of course you know and we need prognosticators among us i think of climate scientists as the prognosticators you know, as the as the shamans of our time in some way, because they are telling us the future that we are about to see the same way that omens did for our ancestors, the same way that oracles performed for our ancestors. The oracles of our day are these are the, are the climate scientists and we need that we need that, but we also need to be able to enter another kind of time so in in some of these non-dual traditions there are four times there is uh like in the tradition of dzogchen for those of you out there who might know the word dzogchen or great perfection uh tradition uh long chenpa one of the, the yogis of that tradition speak of four times the past the present the future, and you might think, wait, that's it, right? No, but they speak of this fourth time. They call it the fourth time. Um, also call it the timeless time, the fourth time and the timeless time, the time that transcends linear time. And, and that is the time, I feel the time of the tree reminds me of that fourth time in that fourth time, there is just now, but not a now that's bounded by past and future, but a now that is radical, a now that is on the knife edge of what we are experiencing. It's the now that we can slow down into, you know, we're so propelling into future or even when we're present, it's a bounded present, there still will be the future and there was the past, but there's this possibility of entering into this relationship with time that I imagine when I try to imagine what a tree is experiencing, of course, who knows, we're not a tree, I'm not a tree, but in my imaginative process, that tree doesn't think about the future and isn't ruminating on the past, that tree is totally interdependent with what is right here and right now that is the fourth time so to start wanted to start out with that when i think about when i think about as kevin asked what what comes up for me when i think about uh slowing down and listening it has something to do with entering into the portal of the radical present where nothing needs to be accomplished or fixed but i can be with what is as it is without needing to manage it somehow and 
and, and, and it seems like, you know, when we're confronted by the urgency of what our planet needs that, well, that would be wasting time to be in the timeless time. But from another perspective, that timeless time could be this place of birthing a new way of being on the planet that is kinder and more aware of what is right here and right now, more responsive and less reactive. So that's what I have to offer this morning. I hope it's helpful. Mm -hmm. um, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Um, Michael, would you like to continue from there? Sure, and uh, thank you so much, Wella. That's a lot to think about or feel into. Yeah, um, Sarah urged me to repeat this thing that we were talking about just before, which is that uh, as I was getting ready to join this call, my wife asked me what I was up to. So I told her and she said, well, you're no good at slowing down. <laughs> so it's really just aspirational, the idea that uh, we have good practices, techniques, ideas, but living them out is always a, uh, something else again. Um, I would say actually that she is pretty good at slowing down and she's taught me a lot. I'm just a slow learner. So it's been about, 37 years, and eventually she'll get me to slow down more. But um, I think why now is a really good question. And I really appreciated the way, Willa, you put it, that everything is always speeding up, the pace of technology, pace of climate change, pace of disasters, pace of uh, totalitarianism. It's always speeding up. And it's as if it calls to us to uh, be similarly hasty, to um, fight against it quickly, you know, because things are happening and they're dangerous. But that is the only, and maybe there's a place for that, like you were saying, prognosticators and actors, and which we can all be at different times. If you're going to a protest demonstration, you know, you have to make the train or whatever, get there on time. There's a time to rush, but the suspicious pace ever since the internal combustion engine and our reliance on electricity, the suspicious pace of modern life, I think we all recognize, or probably everyone on this call recognizes, has a, another kind of call to us, which is to slow down. For instance, to the pace of nature, as you were saying, and I remember Ram Das used to suggest to people who were terminally ill and felt there's so little time left, they should go sit by a river for a day. And they would look at the clouds and look at the trees and look at the river. And they would come to feel, maybe sometimes they were bored even, they would feel actually there is time. By slowing down, there's more time. By speeding up, there's less time. We need that to find what is our valid intuitive response at this time to all these disasters, which will sometimes look like rushing into battle, and sometimes it will look like just doing nothing. But if we don't have the trick of slowing down at least some of the time, we won't get into the depths of what the current moment can teach us. So in our normal daily pace in which we get things done efficiently and we're racing from thing to thing, we stay on the surface. You can even read a wonderful text or hear someone give a beautiful um, impassioned speech. But if your mind is fast, if your mind is the mind of efficiency and rushing, you just get the surface level of what's being said. But if you can treasure what the person is saying or what you're reading, etc., the music you're listening to, if you can be there with it into this fourth time Willow was talking about, then it turns out it actually has qualities and resonances and depths that 
that just aren't there for a hasty listening or understanding, oh, I already know that. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't go into you. Nothing can happen for you. And you won't be all you can be in this mind of efficiency. By the way, there's a wonderful book, Sarah, you were talking about readings. There's a wonderful book by Jay Griffiths. She wrote a book now quite a few years ago called A Sideways Look at Time, which I really recommend. It is itself a book that's untroubled by efficiency because it has no real argument and anything could be anywhere, but it's an incredible treasure trove of insights that she has about time. One of them I just want to mention is that when the first, um, when the first street clocks were there in London in the 19th century, they, they didn't feel there was a need for a minute hand. There was only an hour hand. Why would you bother with minutes, let alone seconds? But she has innumerable wonderful things in that book, A Sideways Look at Time. So I want to um, just bring up a final image, which is I did a lot of work, as uh, Kevin mentioned, thank you in the introduction with uh, the terminally ill. And as we age, we all have to do with the terminally ill, including ourselves. And um, being around someone who's dying has a way of slowing you down, at least in the moments when you're bedside. When there's no more medical rush, and when we consider what's happening with the planet or large swaths of the planet, I think we're up for not only efforts to ameliorate, but we also want to be up for the deepenings that can happen to us when we're around something dying, deepenings into life beyond life. We don't get that through the mind of efficiency. So that's what I wanted to say for the moment. Thank you, Michael. And with that, Emily. Thank you, Willa. Thank you, Michael. Um, I, I wanted to speak on this subject as a, as a writer. Um, as a journalist, but in a way that I, I hope um, relates to just being human in terms of thinking about deep listening and slowing down. First, I wanted to tell a story about a time when I didn't do a good job of deep listening. And it was um, an interview I had this time last year with the artist Kehinda Wiley, who many of you may know is, um, he did the portrait of uh, Barack Obama, a very wonderful, um, exceptional and quite famous artist. And uh, my assignment was to interview him and I was perhaps out of insecurity or, or ego overprepared. I had so many questions for this man. I only had um, 45 minutes to speak with him because he's very busy. And I filled most of that time with my own questions so that later when I listened to the interview tape from which I was supposed to write my interview, I was embarrassed by um, my failure at listening because I had filled this, these precious minutes, this artist I deeply admire with my own voice, leaving very little time for his insight. And in fact, very little time for an interview that could reveal anything new about him. So what I ended up writing was more or less boilerplate. You know, uh, we were in what Michael just described as that like surface mind, surface mind conversation because I, I didn't understand at that time that I I really should have showed up and 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 not said anything. <laughs> I just listened to this man and observed him, or even sat in silence because I might have noticed some things you know, outside of what he might have shared with speech, um, you know, from his gesture or his style of dress or his smile, right? Anyway, that was, I think, a failure of deep listening 
But it taught me, um, okay, the next time in, I'm in the presence of somebody who has wisdom to share with me, I need, I need to come prepared with, um, you know, silence, like a deeper, a slow mind. If I want to enter something like what Willa described as, um, you know, fourth time, deep time, where, where some deeper truth could be revealed, then I need to be quiet. Um, so the second story I wanted to share with you is I, I just had an opportunity to go to the Arctic um, to do some, some interviews with elders in the Yupik community. These are people who live on, in the Yukon River Delta Basin. I only had a week to be there, which was a very small amount of time to interview people who are living what feels to me like the edge of the earth. But of course, it depends where your center is, what you think of as the edge. <laughs> But, um, you know, scientists agree this is the, the, the front line of the climate crisis, right? So what these people are witnessing and experiencing is really, really um, profound sense of awesome change. And um, I, I understood that I needed to enter that situation with great humility and silence to just receive um, what these elders have perceived about their, the, the changes to their environment, their land and their water over the course of their lifetimes and to ask them you know, for their wisdom. Um, so I said very little, um, especially because a week to have traveled, you know, it took me two days to get there and two days to get back and to be there only for such a short amount of time meant I couldn't flit with surface mind questions and chatter. I had to be a deep listener. And um, so I just said to the elders that I was lucky enough to um, interview, you know, I've, I've come from New York City. Uh, I've come as a writer, but really I've come as a mother um, because I'm scared for the future of my children. And I know that you've seen change here and I've seen change where I live too. I wanna know what you've seen and what you can tell me um, if you're willing to share. Um, what kind of wisdom I can take back. And that was pretty much all I said. I also located myself. I said, I come from New York, which is unceded Lenape territory. <laughs> um, and I just listened. And I, and I did receive great wisdom. And the biggest wisdom I received was, um, you know, what we can do with the time that we have. You know, they said this in different ways, um, is take care of each other. And the last thing I'll say is that when I was um, coming back home, there were these little airplanes that take you from one little village to the next little village to the, ne to the next little village, to the slightly larger, larger village. <laughs> Um, to the town, to the, to the, to the city. And, and so there were all these airplanes and on one of these little airplanes taking me home, there was a woman sitting next to me. And before we took off, she, she was in um, deep pain. She was grieving, like, like uh, crying, like an animal in a trap. And um, there were only maybe six of us on this airplane. So the fact that she was grieving wasn't something I could easily ignore, but I did have a moment of thinking, you know, what, what should I do in this situation? And I remembered something a mentor told me once, which is if you ever have a question about whether or not to extend kindness to somebody, like the answer is yes, you should do it. So I put my hand on her shoulder and she turned to me, uh, this is a, a Yupik woman, and she said, um, I'm on this plane to go to the next, you know, the next village to see my mother uh, on her deathbed. And I've just learned that she's, she's already died. I missed, I missed the chance to say goodbye. And she just, you know, she kept failing. And, um, and then she asked me, would it be okay if, if you held me? And I said, um, I didn't say anything. I just leaned into her and I knew actually as a mother, even though she's older than me, how I should hold her and, and she put her head right here um, kind of between my shoulder and my breast and I stroked her hair and I just went shh as the plane took off and so that whole ride I just stroked her and she wept and um, she said it's never going to be the same again is it 
and she was talking about that specific loss, but embedded in that statement for me was, was all of the loss that I'd been hearing about and witnessing in the Arctic for that week. And um, I said, no, <laughs> it's not. I, I, and I know how you feel because I lost my father this year. And um, she said, yeah, I feel like an orphan. <laughs> And I was wearing a pink scarf around my neck and I took it off as the plane landed and I put it around her neck and I said, you know, um, your heart is in a dark place right now. And it's hard for you to see color, but I want you to remember there's color all around you. And um, uh, the next time you see somebody suffering, I hope you'll give them this scarf. <laughs> and she said, Kiana, which is a word in Yupik that means thank you. I really needed the support. But I, you know, that was a moment of um, deepening, deepening, uh, like fourth time. It was outside of time. It was not that long I spent with this woman, stranger <laughs> crying in my arms, but it, but it felt like a true moment and um, a deep moment. And I felt like I was able to extend and exist in that moment because I understood, um, yeah, the wisdom of, you know, the wisdom I, I'd kind of come to or received in the Arctic of, of like, with all of this um, loss, the thing we can do is care for each other, that, that I had heard that, that I'd been present to receive and um, listen to that. Uh, meant that I was able to be in deep time and extend it in a way that, uh, despite all the the loss, right, really really mattered actually um, when it happened. So that's what I wanted to share today. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Emily. Such a powerful story, and from each of you as well. And so, at this point, I'd like to turn it back to the three of you. Is there anything that you want to reflect on what you just heard from the other two? Uh, any threads you would like to follow up on or questions you would like to ask? Well, since um, am I audible? You are, yeah, go ahead, Michael. Um, since COVID, I haven't been meeting patients in my office. I meet people in the woods. And uh, we that has a long story I don't wanna get into, but it's very different um, meeting people and walking in the woods from being in an office. And uh, it has everything to do with um, climate change, but also to our being, you know, the physical body often in a meeting of humans, the physical body, our body is the only part that isn't man made, so to speak, because <laughs> we don't make the body, we just make all the stuff around. But when you're out in the woods, you're at least partly with stuff humans have not, have not messed with, and it brings you into it naturally slows everybody down, me, the patient, but anyway, I wanted to challenge Willa, or invite you, to say a little more about what you were saying with your practices with nature and how you weave that in with your um, Buddhist uh, teachings. Thanks, Michael. And I'm just inspired to hear that you are doing that with your patients. That makes so much sense because there's a some healing potential in just getting out of the structured the structured um, context that we have created for our human selves into the places where we start to feel the animal in us wake up and that animal um it's, you know in some ways we neglect it would neglect the animal um in us i think often i do certainly and uh so for me the at this point um the wild is a is a teacher and going into those spaces is actually asking for teaching um so um 
similar to how you bring your patients into their in a, in a context for healing i bring my my seeker self you know the seeker <laughs> the archetypical seeker of teaching seeker of inspiration seeker of uh, transmission into those wild spaces and have found that um, through a process of listening receptivity in those spaces it's I never come back without having received the teaching <laughs> the teaching from the tree or from the the ground or from the animal that walks past or from the caterpillar there's a kind of um, teaching us how to be in these times that can come from the wild uh, to to us. And, you know, just the other day I was hiking um, with a friend yesterday and we were um, we were up on a on a on a bald um, like a peak a bald granite peak and up there, you know, you'd think there wouldn't be much that was alive uh, with solid, just solid rock. But as we looked closer, there were quite a few of these, these tiny little fuzzy caterpillars that are gray and black. And they looked just like, you know, they had been, they had evolved to look just like the cracks in the rock, you know, just the perfect sort of camouflage evolution and you know for me something about that wisdom of um of blending blending in with the natural world the way that that caterpillar was you know encouraging the the symbiosis with the environment so that you aren't feeling separate from it you know so something like that can just put me into a state of feeling not separate from it just by seeing the way the caterpillar embodies not separate from it. That's just a little example. Thank you. Nature is teacher. How about you, Willa or Emily? Do either of you have something you'd like to follow up with? Emily, I just loved your story. I would have a, a question for you as a writer. Um, how does listening, um, move into your writing space? Like, how do you see that relationship between the receptivity and the process of flowing out onto the page. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. We're all, the three of us are writers and you're, you have done so much work in that area. It's so inspiring to me as, as a person. I would love to hear how that process works for you. Mm, thanks for the question, Willa. I think I'm very interested in um, increasingly in, in like witness testimony from, from people we would describe as being at the front lines of the climate crisis, but, but not as victims, but rather as teachers, you know? So what that means to me as a writer is, you know, asking respectfully, like, what do you have to teach us based on whatever hardship or, or disaster you may have survived. Um, what have you learned from that? And, and, then, and then listening and, and trying to capture those words and share them because I think we have um, those of us fortunate enough not to have, you know, had to migrate yet, for example, um, or lost our home, have a lot to learn from people who have. Uh, you know, about taking care of each other and about community. So I think listening, you know, um, yeah, I think I I'm really processing what you've said today about wilderness as teacher, you know, the wild as teacher, nature as teacher, 
but also people who I think are often framed as victims as teacher um, and thinking of them instead as um, knowledge bearers or people who have wisdom that at this juncture in the unfolding crisis, we all need. Um, that, that's what I'm learning, I think, as a writer. Yeah, in uh, graduate school, I had a professor, Paul Wachtel, and he wrote a bunch of books. And one of his books he dedicated to my patients who paid to teach me, you know, because <laughs> he's supposed to be uh, dispensing expertise or wisdom or something, but he realized he learned everything about life from his supposed patients. And that's certainly been borne out in my career that I really learn about the world from the people who are supposedly broken or hurting and I'm supposed to help them, but they've helped me immeasurably. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it's just really rings true what you're saying now. Um, that And uh, it reminds me also, do you know the book by Rebecca Solnit, um, A Paradise Built in Hell, uh, where she talks about uh, disaster, often climate disaster, challenged communities and how they develop as communities and take care of each other, as you put it. Mm. And it's just very, um, that's now a pre an older book, it seems very relevant to me, but you're making it more relevant and uh, finding the current examples of that. But I think it's continuous from the brokenness that out of which all so much wisdom comes and now We've arranged for a world of brokenness, so there's a lot more wisdom coming. I really appreciated, Michael, how you drew the connection between the, the transition between the phase of treatment and the phase of hospice and, and how that changes the sense of of how we are with someone um, and, and how they are with themselves. And I did wonder, I uh, wanted to, to ask if you could elaborate a little bit more. Um, I think what I, what I picked up from you that I'm really ruminating on right now is that um, when the, that hospice phase starts and like, you know, you were saying, well, in some ways we can be with the the planet as um, both in the, its medical, you know, the amelioration and the um, the the wanting to treat the 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 illnesses, so to speak, of the planet, versus the way of being with the planet as one might be with a hospice patient, more um, um, fully present with it with with that planet in its present nature just as it is and and that's not a giving up i think i think that this is this is what i'm i'm starting to think about is i think when when we bring up a model of that model you know perhaps it could bring up for a listener anyone you know maybe right here on this group well well doesn't that mean that we're giving up on the planet or if someone is is dying are we giving up on them and given that you've done so much work in hospice i would love or in sitting with the dying i wondered if you could elaborate a little bit on that pivot between the treatment and and how we how that might apply to the planet well uh actually you've just stated it really well i'm not sure i'd do any better but but um uh, of course, it's a whole lot messier with the planet. There's 8 billion people and a lot of different situations and there are places on Earth that look to be thriving and, of course, a lot of places that are disastrous and people um, grievously suffering, if not dead, and, and dead from this. So yeah, I don't think we can look at the whole planet and have a unitary thing towards it as if it's dying as a whole or even humanity dying as a whole. I don't really think that's going to happen for a long time. But that's why I say messy. But, but there is a place for that with, let's say, a beach that's lost 
a home that's lost, a cliff that's melted into the sea. There's a place for something like when you're with a dying person and you're, you get a sense of, well, again, these are the depths that come from slowing down. You get a sense of a beauty, grace, presence, I don't know what to say, that isn't limited to the physical expression and even runs counter to the physical expression. So if you just look at the physical situation with its distressing sights and sounds or absence of sound and smells, you're you're really appalled. But if you're kind of setting those things to one side or having those in your peripheral vision and focusing on what all else might be there, I'm sure everyone in this call has had experiences where you feel, well, there are other things going on that are beautiful or good or connecty that I can't prove and that are in the midst of this apparent disaster. So something like that, as I say, can happen with an aspect of nature, a, a landscape and so on, where the beautiful life is gone and yet you feel, well, I'm still with it. It's still towards me in spite of everything. That's all I want to say. Would other of you like to respond to that? And, and if not, perhaps we're coming to the close of the discussion period. Maybe if each of you would like to just take a moment and kind of say some last thoughts. And Emily, would, looks like you might be willing to start. No, it just occurs to me that a through line feels like what we're talking about is um, sitting with death, you know, the, um, the richness that comes to sitting next to death and the knowledge of death and the ways that that can bring beauty and connection. And um, I, it's, it's a lesson, <laughs> it's, a, it's a hard, beautiful lesson. That's all. Thank you, Emily. Michael. Well, uh, I feel like closing with a poem by Rilke. Mm. It's not too long. I know people's patience for poetry can be <laughs> brief, but the poem is brief. Here we go. We rush and rush, but count time's step as tiny in the vaster hush. All this craziness must be past, for we're enlightened by that which lasts. Don't waste your courage in fight or flight. Listen and look as calm overtakes both dark and bright, flower and book. It sounds like that poem was written for this thing. <laughs> it's written for this, like the slowing down and the listen and the listening. Um, yeah, just so appreciative for, for this reflection and, um, and also just thinking about how slowing down puts us in this intimate relationship with both death and birth, because when you slow down, you start to notice that both are happening all the time. It's not like that a death is something that's going to happen, but actually it's already active. It's happening right now and birth is happening right now. So I was just, um, 
appreciating so much your um, that we that we somehow that came in this morning the 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 intimacy with birth and death opened up by the by the relationship to being being slowing down and having this different relationship to time um, yeah, I just want to, I guess I just want to end with, with gratitude for the conversation and, and curiosity about how we will unpack it further together. Thank you. Thank you, Willa. And I'll add my gratitude to that. Uh, thank you to the three of you for uh, your time today, today and sharing your wisdom um, as we look at slowing down and listening. There will be so much for each of us to unpack. Uh, as we let this conversation sit with us in the coming days. Um, Sarah, is there anything you would like to add before we move into our uh, breakout council groups? Just huge gratitude. I, <clears throat> I'm already looking forward to watching the recording again <laughs> <laughs> for all that's here. Thank you all so much for this conversation. And I, I think we really are ready for our circles. Um, 